Hi everyone, my name is Jen. I'm an author and a book reviewer. Happy New Year. I decided to try and resurrect this wig this morning and I'm not sure it was the best decision but it's on my head now and I've collected all the books around me so we're just, we're just gonna crack on. I have decided to live life on the edge today and I'm filming the day that this video is gonna be uploaded. I don't tend to do that anymore. I try to film in advance but I wanted to film the wrap up for the end of the year after the year had ended and also after handing in a book piece on the 28th I've taken the last few days off off which has been very very nice. Mr M and I had our 17 year anniversary the other day which that's a lot of years. That's a lot of years and we've been playing some unlocked games, we've been going for rainy walks, it's been a lovely time. So I haven't done a reading wrap up since August. I didn't end up reading anything in September because I was off all month because I was ill, didn't pick up a single book. And so we have October, November and December. I have three piles of books scattered around me. However, I have talked about the majority of these books in reading vlogs. Um, and I will link all relevant reading vlogs in the description box down below. So I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail for each specific book. I'll talk more about the books that I haven't spoken about before anywhere on this channel. I'll definitely do that. But I kind of just want to whiz through everything and give you short, snappy reviews, one or two sentences. Did I like it? Did I not like it? And why? And then let's move on to what I think we care about most, or at least I care about most which are the statistics. <laughs> um, I use Storygraph to catalogue my reading. I moved over there entirely from Goodreads a couple of years ago. So they have some great pie charts, which I will insert on the screen as we go. But then I've also recorded some of my own data, I think for the first time, really. Yes. So I will also be talking about that data as well. Next Sunday, I will be uploading my best books of the year video but I wanted to look back over the year first before we start talking about favourites, but I have already decided what my favourites are. Okay, so let's do the quick whiz through roundup for the last three months of the year. Uh, let's begin with October because that month comes first. October was kind of a rubbish reading month for me, to be honest. So the first project I think I did in October was to read the books from the Man Booker shortlist that I hadn't read yet. I'd read the majority of them when I did a long list video, but there were two I hadn't read from the shortlist. I will link both those videos in the description box down below. So I read The Trees by Percival Everett, which I enjoyed but didn't love. I thought the pacing was off in places. It was also a little bit repetitive, but I liked it. I would say if Jordan Peele and Fargo came together and wrote a book, I'm aware that Jordan Peele was involved in Fargo, but if he created something entirely different that had the spirit of Fargo, I would say this is it. This is it. I liked it. And my favourite from the whole shortlist was O oh William by Elizabeth Strout. I thought perhaps this would suffer from the fact that I hadn't read the previous books in the series, but that ended up not being the case. It's very conversational, very easy to read, which I actually think is quite a difficult thing to do as a writer, make everything seem effortless. Even though this was my favourite book from the shortlist, it was nowhere near one of my favourite books of the year, and that should kind of tell you how I felt about the shortlist as a whole. Spoiler, two books from the long list have made my favourite books of the year, but none from the shortlist. After that, I decided to read books that my favourite authors had recommended to me, and I thought this would be amazing. I thought it would be wonderful. I was sure I was going to find some favourites. It was a flop. It may have been a lot to do with the fact that I wasn't very well because I think we do have to contextualize when we read things but I don't think any of these books would have been super super favorites no you know no matter when I'd read them so first off I read Rosanna which is a Swedish novel and I ended up DNFing this one because I just found again the pacing very strange but mostly just lots of sexist stuff in there and I just I wasn't into it I read Silver and Salt by Eleanor Dimmitt. This is a story about two sisters. I wasn't gripped by it and I found that the imagery in it was a bit too on the nose. Then I read Improvement by Joan Silver. I thought this was all right. I thought it was very forgettable, to be honest. And then I read All My Puny Sorrows by Miriam Taves and I actually really, really loved this one. I did love it. 
Um, it hasn't made it into my favourites list, I think because of how depressing it is. Um, and even though it is a brilliant book, I, I think I would really hesitate, it, hesitate to ever recommend it to somebody and I don't think I will ever reread it. So I appreciate it for what it is, but yeah, there we go, that one. And then I read a few books for Halloween time. So I read Close Your Eyes and Come With Me, which is a little chat book that Kirsty Logan has put together with an artist called Block Forest. It is six, I think six, yeah, spooky short stories. It was fun. Then I read Phantom Pains by Teresa Stacion. And this I didn't read for Halloween. It's just in this pile of remaining books I read in October. This is a collection of poetry looking at disability. I enjoyed it. And then we had The Dangers of Smoking in Bed by Mariana Enriquez, which is translated from the Spanish by Megan McDowell. Again, this one was okay, not one of my favorites. I talked about it in much more detail in that video. And then Tell Me I'm Worth This by Alison Rumfit is a really interesting renewal of the haunted house genre. Um, and it explores queer topics, especially trans identity and I liked this one, but the amount of sexual violence in it meant that I didn't know how I felt about it in the end. Um, it's supposed to be shocking. That's the point of it. So it definitely achieved its goal, but that didn't make me love it, you know? It's gotta be about how well I think a book is written, but then also just the emotional response that I have to a book, right? There are so many different factors involved when it comes to talking about whether or not a book stays with us, whether we want to revisit it, whether it's going to be a favourite, all of that. Then, in November, I went to the New Forest on holiday for a week and I read, I think it was 10 books in that week and I had an amazing reading, well, month in November, but especially that week. So let me divide these books into books that I loved and then books that I didn't love and we can quickly go through them. Let's start with the good stuff, given that October was not a great reading month. So we have The Tea Dragon Tapestry. This is the final book in the Tea Dragon Society trilogy, a beautiful graphic novel that will just wrap you up in a hug. It's about a series of dragons that grow tea from their bodies, which you can brew, which invoke memories. And it's about... A, a, group of characters who meet at various different points and the love that they have for each other. It's really about found family. It's beautiful. Love that. Another book that I read was Layla and the Blue Fox by Kieran Millwood Hargrave. This is a middle grade book illustrated by her husband Tom DeFreston. It is about migration and again found family as well. It is about a girl called Layla who lives in London and her mum has gone to Norway to, to work she's working on researching this particular arctic fox that they have been following and Layla feels like her mum cares more about this fox than she does about her. It's about the importance of communication and the pointlessness of borders and I thought it was great. Then we had Indelicacy by Amina Kane. This is such a quiet book. I would recommend it for fans of Tessa Moshveg. It's about a woman who works in a gallery but really wants to write so she decides to get married so that she has the opportunity to do that. She writes about everything like it's a series of paintings. It was a joy to read. Animals at Night by Naomi Boo. This is a short story collection and what it primarily made me think was I want to read one of her novels. I really like the way that she writes about young parenthood in particular and relationships, spiky relationships. It was great, so I will definitely be reading more of her work in 2023. Another warm hug is Finn Family Moving Troll, Moving Troll? Moving Troll by Toby Janssen. And this is translated from the Swedish by Elizabeth Porch. I don't think I need to tell you about the moments. I think you know what the moments are. This just was lovely. <laughs> then I read The Silent House by Nell Patterson. This is the first in a crime trilogy and it's about a woman called Paige Northwood who is a BSL interpreter. She's the only hearing member of her family. She's called to the house of a deaf family whose young daughter has been murdered. They weren't aware of anybody coming into the house during the night. Paige is there to interpret between the family and the police. 
and because Paige is the only hearing member of her family, she's been part of the deaf community for ages and she knows everyone involved because it's such a tight knit community, which means that obviously she feels very emotionally connected to what is going on. It's a brilliant book. I was absolutely hooked. I guessed some revelations and didn't guess others, which is what you want, because you want to feel like you've sold some of it, but you also want to be surprised. Another brilliant book was Ghost Music by Anne Yu. I won't talk about this really much at all here. I wrote a whole article about it, which I'll link in the description box down below. But if you've read her first book, Braised Pork, you will know what to expect. I would recommend this for fans of Besua, I think if you've read Untold Night and Day, I think you would really, really love this. And then this is A Helping Hand by Celia Dale, a crime novel from the 1960s, reissued this year by Daunt Books. This was, I was gonna say a pleasant surprise, but that would indicate that I didn't think I was going to love it in the first place. For the most part in this book, you know as the reader what's going on, it's just other characters who aren't aware. Sometimes that can be really fun in a book and sometimes it can be a bit frustrating because you might feel like it drags, you know too much. But I thought it was balanced really well. Um, it was witty, but also a bit dark and, and gross. Um, I would say if you like Muriel Spark, you will really, really like this. Then books that I, I didn't get on with, we had The Offing by Benjamin Myers. The writing in this I felt was a bit too over the top and not to my taste. Um, I, actually, this one shouldn't be in this pile. I also read the Forward Book of Poetry 2023, which I enjoyed very much. Um, this is an anthology of all the people who've been shortlisted and won this year's Forward Prize for Poetry in the wrong pile. I liked it. Um, going back to books I didn't like, this was The Loosening Skin by Alia Whiteley. I think I've come to the conclusion that I admire and love her work, but I prefer her short stories and novellas to her novels because I think that... The topics that she explores are so otherworldly and bizarre that for me they work best in short form. So I think I will concentrate on those in the future. The Master Key by Masako Togawa. This is translated from the Japanese by Simon Grove is a crime novel that I found to be very predictable and therefore didn't enjoy very much. Spear by Nicola Griffith. This is just a matter, I was gonna say of personal taste. All of this is a matter of personal taste, but this I just knew from the beginning I wasn't gonna enjoy. Sometimes I like fantasy, I do, but this was quite intense fantasy and it just, yeah, not for me. And I'm gonna find a home for this one because I know that so many people love it. So please don't disregard this if you like fantasy and have it on your radar, because I'm sure that you will love it. It's just not personally for me. And then there was I Want to Die, But I Want to Eat Tepoki by Baek Si He, translated from the Korean by Anton Her. This is a series of transcripts that she's typed up sessions between her and her therapist, which she recorded on audio. I just found this to be a little bit basic and it didn't dive deep enough for me and I found that frustrating. I know loads of people love this, but I unfortunately wasn't one of them. So those were all the books I read in October and November. Let's move into December. There's one book that I'm carrying over into 2023 and that is Crying in H Mart by Michelle Zauner. I'm listening to this one on audio and really enjoying it, but I wasn't gonna finish it by the new year and I didn't wanna rush it, so I didn't. I then read the next two books in the uh, Nell Patterson Silent Trilogy. So I read Silent, which one comes first? Silent Night, which is set at a school trip where uh, a teacher and a student, well, the student goes missing and one of the teachers dies. And then Silent Suspect is uh, outside of a school setting and is just in uh, public space again. I, again, really enjoyed reading these two, but I definitely prefer the first one, which is Silent House. Um, you could read that one as a standalone. I still recommend going to the second two. I think the thing about these two that meant I didn't enjoy them quite as much is that there is a romance element to them. I'm just never into reading romances. That's just me. <laughs> so that meant my enjoyment was slightly lessened, but I still loved reading this trilogy and would very much recommend them. I listened to um, Woman Eating by Claire Coda on audiobook. It was narrated by Katie Lung. This is a, a really fun vampire novel, different to any kind of vampire novel I'd read before, and I, and I loved it. I was 
so pleasantly surprised by Weasels in the Attic by Hiroko Oyamada, which is translated from the Japanese by David Boyd. I was surprised because I'd read her book, The Factory, and really hated it. Um, but I love this one. I thought it was, to use the word I don't like, quirky and weird, uh, with so much linking imagery. I read this in a vlog where I was reading books about food and dinner parties and I loved it. I didn't love, unfortunately, two of the other ones in that vlog. There was The Six Who Came to Dinner and The Dinner Party by Sarah Gil Martin. Both of those were books I didn't enjoy. You can head over to that vlog to find out more if you want. I did end up liking You Are Eating an Orange, <coughs> excuse me, You Are Naked by Shung King, but over the past few weeks, I found this to be very forgettable. So I liked it at the time and I thank it for the time that I spent with it, but um, it hasn't lingered. I read the next Moomin book in the series, which is Moomin Valley in November, which again, I enjoyed, but I didn't love it as much as the first one. I think primarily because this is a book that isn't focused on the Moomins, it's focused on secondary characters. It was lovely to get to know them more, but I missed the Moomins, I missed them. I read two poetry collections. I read Oxygen by Julia Fidazuk, and this is translated from the Polish by Bill Johnson. I picked this up because I saw one of the poems online and fell in love with it. Unfortunately, that was really the only poem in the collection that I ended up loving. Sometimes that happens, but I'm willing to take a chance because sometimes that's how you find your favorite new poets, you know? And I also read Another Way to Split Water by Alicia Pimahamid. I so loved her reading. We did an event together for the 100 Queer Poems anthology, which she is also part of. So I really wanted to read her collection. Um, I really enjoyed this one. And one of the questions that I got actually, when I asked you, if you had any questions about my year in reading, was any nature poets you would recommend? And she tackles nature in a really wonderful way and how it relates to um, body and memory. So if you're looking for new nature poetry that's a little bit different, then I would recommend that. I read a non-fiction book called Easy Beauty by Chloe Cooper-Jones. This is about art, philosophy, and disability. Um, I would say it's like a combination of Sitting Pretty by Rebecca Tausig and Frida Kahlo and My Left Leg by Emily Rapp Black, but I ended up loving both of those books more than this one. There were sections of this that I really, really loved, but overall it's, it's not one of my favourite books of the year. I mean, not every book can be, can it? Um, but if we're talking about recommendations, I would probably recommend those two before recommending this, but if you've read those two books and you enjoyed them, then definitely head to this one and see what you think about it. The final reading vlog of the year, which was last week, I read um, books set in the snow. So I will just hold these up because it was literally last week that I talked about them. Eileen by Atessa Moshveg, enjoyed it, but have preferred other books by her. Same with Cold Earth by Sarah Moss. This is her debut, like with um, Eileen, and it was fun to see the origin of her writing, or at least the published origin of her writing, and so many themes that she explores in later books. I thought that that was fascinating. Not a favourite of mine, but very glad to have read it. And then All About Sarah by Pauline Delabroy Allard, which is translated from the French by Adriana Hunter. This one I really didn't enjoy at all. I just thought it was um, style over substance mostly and I uh, didn't gel with it. Then we have, finally, we're nearly there and into the stats, the books that I read that were not part of any reading vlogs. So I finished reading Life Ceremony by Sayaka Murata, which is translated from the Japanese by Jenny Tapley Takamori. I liked maybe, well, I liked most of the stories in here. I loved maybe two or three of them. I much preferred it when she was talking about, say, flesh being turned into objects that you could have in your home after you die, as opposed to things about sexual violence, which is generally how I feel about her work in, you know, as a whole. Then I read Vladimir by Julia May Jonas. This was our Patreon book club pick. And I really enjoyed this so much more than I thought I was going to, because when I started reading this book, it reminded me quite a lot of Lionel Shriver's writing. And I wasn't sure about it, but I loved all the imagery in it. The ending is a play on Jane Eyre, which you know I very much like. So yeah, I would definitely recommend this book. I'm not going to do a deep dive into it 
in this video right here, but I do give this book my, my stamp of approval. The Sad Part Was by Pravda Yoon, which is translated from the Thai by Mweepa Popsicle, was sadly a short story collection where I loved the first short story in the book, and then I felt the rest of the book kind of deflated a little bit, um, which was a shame, but I will remember it for the first story, which I actually read I think in 2021 when I was going through my short story shelves, I reread it when I went back to the book. Um, but if you want to hear my thoughts on the story that I loved, I will link that short story video in the description box down below. I read an anthology called Body Language, Writers on Identity, Physicality and Making Space for Ourselves. This is a collection of essays that were first published in Catapult magazine. And there's a great range of voices in here, um, essays about... Um, queerness, about race, about disability, um, so many different things. As with any anthology, there were obviously some pieces that I loved and some that I was less keen on. But as a whole, this is a book I would definitely thrust into people's hands. I probably, unsurprisingly, first and foremost, love the essays that were talking about disability. There were also a few essays in here talking about IVF as well and that was why I ended up picking it up in the first place. I'm actually not wanting to read long pieces about IVF. If you're going through something I feel like you tend not to want to read about it all the time as well but these pieces are so short and I got a message from one of you from Moles, thank you, saying that one of the short essays in here was about a writer who was going through IVF and it was not working and they got ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome and they were coping with everything through baking and it felt like it mirrored my life a bit too much to not read it so that's why I picked this up in the first place and I was really happy to have read the book in its entirety as well. A book that I had saved for um, between Christmas and New Year was The Appeal by Janice Hallett. So many people raved about this is it like two years ago now, I think, because she already has another book out. I'm sure you've heard about it because it was everywhere. It's a crime novel that's inviting you to solve it because it's these found documents, emails, text messages, um, leaflets, flyers, notes that have been taken, you know, minutes, meetings. And it's set in this small community, centered around community theater, actually, and the people involved in this drama group the head of the drama group's granddaughter has been diagnosed with cancer and they need to do a, a huge fundraiser for it. But there are suspicions flying everywhere about how legit, um, first of all, the fundraising is whether there are f there's fraudulent elements going on with companies um, who are providing the medicine, just lots of things to think about in the background as well as just the narrative of people's lives. I found this book to be so compelling. It's massive, it's nearly 500 pages, but I read it uh, nearly in two sittings. I thought that there was a lot to love about this book, but also its discussion of Africa was really odd, because at first I thought, okay, so characters are talking about Africa like it's a country because they are very naive people, and this is in part a commentary on the naivety of white people who want to donate money to things to make themselves feel better um, and be saviors. So I thought that that was what the book was doing. But then as the book got towards the end, I kind of felt like maybe that wasn't what the book <laughs> was doing, um, or at least if that was what it was setting out to do, it didn't achieve that in a very, um, well, in the best way possible at all. And it left me with a bit of a sour taste in my mouth. I just wasn't sure about that element of the book. So yeah, I don't know. Some bits I liked, some bits I was very confused by. And then finally, I'm not gonna talk about this one very much because spoiler, it's one of my favorite books of the year. But I read this also between Christmas and New Year and my goodness, it is so good, it's so good. It's called Still Missing by Beth Goodgen. It's published by Persephone Books. It's I think one of, if not their most, then one of their most recent books in the sense that they publish classics, but this is from the 80s. Um, it's a mystery novel, it's about a young boy who goes missing, and then we are following his family in the aftermath of that. I was obsessed with this book, I was so obsessed, and the themes that it explored, um, it's very, very 80s, um, and it's also looking at homophobia and about police bias when it comes to queer people, and it made me so nervous, this book, because I didn't know where it was going at various points, and I was like, oh, that, it just... 
it stressed me out okay it stressed me out and then I just sobbed at this book as well it was brilliant so I'll talk about it more next week okay so those are all the books that I needed to wrap up before I could talk to you about all the stats I feel like I need a cup of tea so I'm gonna go make a cup of tea and then I'm gonna come back with my notebook and we're gonna talk about percentages hi I'm back I may look slightly disheveled because I decided to not only I was gonna say make a cup of tea this is my second cup of tea but I decided to also do some cleaning and also get started on dinner so um, I don't know if I'm covered in flour I might be but I am here to talk about stats I have a notebook in my hand you know that means that I'm serious I'll also get story graph up on my phone and I will shuffle across so I can insert some images as and when all right so let's start with the main question how many books did I read in 2022 so I read 165 books in 2022. I didn't set any goal actually um, for reading. I tend not to these days. I used to, but given that books are so much a part of my life and my job, I just don't. So I read what I read and that's fine. Um, one of you asked how I felt about my reading year in general. Um, I think it was, a mixed reading year. I think I read some really amazing things and I think I read some stuff that I didn't love quite so much and probably more of that than I'm used to in more recent years. I think I've got so much better at predicting what kind of book I will enjoy but because I do challenges where I'll read a whole like prize long list for instance there are inevitably going to be books that I wouldn't have chosen to read in the first place and therefore in some cases though not in all those are going to be books that I don't end up loving. Occasionally though, I am surprised and that's how you find new favourite authors you never would have picked up in the first place and that's why I like prizes, why I like doing those challenges and why I like watching other people doing those challenges too. So yeah, I read 165 books in 2022 which was 38,533 pages. Um, I decided I would compare that to last year, which is interesting because in 2021, I read 147 books, but that was 35,939 pages. So really it was only 2000 words difference between those two years, even though it was about 20 books different. So I think I must have read more short books this year than I did the previous year which is why it's always good to look at um, page count and not just books on their own. Hilariously, my split between fiction and non-fiction in 2022 and 2021 was exactly the same. So it was 85% fiction and 15% non-fiction. And then I read 92% of my books in physical form, in print form, 8% in audio. Um, and then this is something that I thought was fun. I thought I would go through my book hauls from 2022 and see how many books came into my life in the past year. I haven't done this before, so I don't have a comparative figure. But if you wanna have a guess, have a think, have a guess how many books came into my life in 2022. It was 160. So 160 books came into my life and I read 165 books in the year. So I suppose that's only knocking my TBR down by five in the grand scheme of things, but at least it's five in the right direction. And I also have probably, well, I know I definitely have unhauled more books this year. Um, books, for instance, that I DNF that I didn't end up speaking about on the channel. If I've got the majority of the way through a book, or at least a really good chunk, and I think this is not for me, I'll talk about it in a wrap up. I'll talk about why I didn't end up continuing with it. But if I literally read the very beginning of a book, and maybe it's a book I bought years and years ago, and I just think, think excuse me, like this is not for me these days, then I don't tend to talk about it in uh, a video. So there will be other books that have left my shelves this year that I don't have record of. But yeah, the ones recorded, we are minus five on the TBR in total this year. Okay, let's look at some um, percentages. 
translated fiction. I asked you on Instagram what things you would like me to talk about when it came to stats and some of these questions will be answered in the stats I'd already catalogued and I'm going to speak about now and then I'll answer some extra questions that I didn't cover myself in the data that I collected. So um, how many translated books did I read? 33 out of the 165 books that I read in 2022 were translated books. So that's 20% of my reading. I don't know if that surprised me. I probably would have guessed that it was around that amount, 20%. And um, this is not for just translated books, but for how many different countries I read from, whether translated or not. I read from 25 different countries in 2022. Probably unsurprisingly, the UK was the country that I read from the most. 80 books that I read were from the UK. After that, USA, 33 books were from the USA and third most popular country I read from was Japan. I read nine books from Japan but to run through the other countries I read from Korea, Sweden, Canada, Argentina, Ireland, France, Mexico, Indonesia, Nigeria, Poland, Trinidad, China, Iran, Philippines, Thailand, Australia, Turkey, Ukraine, Sri Lanka, India, Puerto Rico and the Netherlands and I, I'm happy with that. I always want to read from more countries so um, you know, I would love to read from more than 25, but given it wasn't a specific goal for 2022, I'm really pleased that organically I seem to be reading from lots of different places. That makes me happy. Um, so yeah, that is something that I'm really pleased with. Um, okay, so books by disabled writers. 17% of the books I read in 2022 were by disabled writers. I don't have comparative data for previous years because this is the first year I've done this. But if I continue into 2023, then we can compare at the end of next year. Um, authors of colour, 40% of the books that I read in 2022 were by writers of colour. And, oh, this was something that I thought I would try and work out, which was a question from one of you, actually. How many books did I read in 2022 that came into my life in 2022? And I think... Oh, and I know the stat now, but before I worked out the stat, I thought it was probably going to be quite high. And actually, the person who asked that question had said, I know it's influenced by your job. I write book reviews for other outlets and primarily they want me to write about new releases, but not always. So that's definitely a dominant part of my reading, but I didn't know the specific number. So it was fun to look at that. So books that I bought or were sent in 2022 was 70% of my reading. So 116 books out of 165. So it's high, but it's not, you know, it's not like 19, 95%. So I'm glad that I still got to books that I owned already that were on my shelves. And something I thought would be interesting to record would be to look at how many books I read published by small presses. And I was really pleased to see that that number is 51%. So 51% of the books I read in 2022 came from small presses. That's lovely. Okay, let's move on to the questions that you asked me. So someone said, do you have any new favorite authors for 2022? And there were two ways that I interpreted this. So there were two authors that I read in 2022 for the second time and loved their second books as well. So we'll now definitely read whatever they bring out in future. And those authors were Bay Sua and uh, Anne Yu. I'd read their books before and I loved the ones I read in 2022, which were Ghost Music and Untold Night and Day. And then an author I read for the first time in 2022 was Nell Patterson. But I did re read three of her books, as you saw earlier in this video, The Silent House, trilogy and I'm definitely going to be reading more of her books in the future. I don't know if she's going to be a favourite author going forward but I'm definitely tempted to pick up whatever she puts out next. Um, another question was how many books did you DNF? I don't actually keep a record of this. Maybe I should do that in 2023. In fact I realised recently that Storygraph have that feature and I've just never utilised it so um, maybe I will do that. Most surprising likes slash dislikes. Um, I was surprised that I liked The Paper Palace as much as I did. I think because I'd heard such mixed things from people. I just found it very compelling and very readable and I was glad that it was on the Women's Prize long list and I got to read it. 
I was thrilled by how much I enjoyed reading the Barbellion Longlist at the beginning of the year. It was the first thing that I did in 2022. It's a prize that celebrates work by chronically ill and disabled authors. And when I read prizes, normally I'll love some books and not others, because obviously it's chosen by a judging panel that doesn't include me in my personal taste. But there was only one book on that long list that I didn't like, which was a really good ratio for me. As for books that I didn't like, um, Scattered All Over the Earth by Yoko Ogawa, not Yoko Ogawa, Yoko Tawada, that was um, a shame because I have enjoyed her work previously and that was, I think, along with Alan Garner's book, Treacle Walker, those two were my worst books of the year, the ones that I enjoyed the least and I was sad that I didn't enjoy either of those books. My favourite translated book is no surprise to anyone, that is Eleanor Knows by Claudia Pinheiro, translated from the Spanish by Frances Riddle. We'll be talking about that more in my video next week, which is my favourite books of the year. Favourite debut, Maps of Our Spectacular Bodies by Maddie Mortimer. I can't believe that that's a debut. It makes, it doesn't make me never want to write again, but it's one of those books that I'm just completely in awe of. It is a masterpiece. That was my favourite debut. Best and worst covers. My worst cover um, was, I think, Improvement by Joan Silver. I just think this is a very, very boring cover. And my favourite covers from books I read this year, I love the Moomin books that are published by, is it Sort Of Books? I love those covers. The Seven Moons of Marley Almeida by Shay and Karen Atalaka, that is a beautiful, beautiful cover. Ghost Music by Anne Yu is also a stunning cover. And I love the reissued versions of Sarah Moss's books that Granta have put out recently. I read Cold Earth, but they've done all of her books that they specifically publish in these beautiful matte covers. They're gorgeous. Someone else said, what was your most read author, not a series? Well, let me answer both series and not series. Nell Patterson, I read three books by Nikki French. I read nine books by, I think, because I reread the Free Decline series and I also reread The Unheard. And then books that are not in a series, Claudia Pinheiro, I read two books by her, and Rio de la Luz, I read two books by her as well. So, oh, and Tove Janssen, I read two books by Tove Janssen. I really don't tend to clearly read lots of books by the same authors. That wasn't true for 2021 because I did my whole project of reading every Nikki French book ever, and I think in 2021 I must have read about 20 of their books. Um, but this year, this year was different. Do you keep a log at all of your books, owned to be read, etc.? I don't. I have considered doing this. I've been listening to the Unbound podcast um, by Raylene and Ariel. Ariel has been cataloguing all her books recently and it's given me an itch to do it too, but I don't think I'm actually going to do it. I think cataloguing the books that I'm reading is probably my limit. What was your favourite slash least favourite reading challenge? So my vlog series now pretty much are all reading challenges and I'll link that playlist in the description box down below. But out of all of the challenges I did this year, like reading the oldest books on my TBR, the shortest, following book prizes, reading books recommended by authors or by you, I think my favourite was reading the Barbellion Prize long list because I had such a good hit rate of books that I loved. And the one that I enjoyed the least, um, or was the least successful, was also one I've already referenced in this video, which is reading books recommended by my favourite authors, because I thought that would go much better than it did, and that was a shame. What was my longest and shortest book? The longest was The Great Circle by Maggie Shipstead, and that was 688 pages. The shortest is probably one of the books by Strangers Press. They do pamphlets um, of work in translation. And for instance, I read, oh, and I forgot to talk about it in my wrap up, but I read one of their Korean pamphlets in December, which is by Han Kang, and it's um, translated from the Korean by Deborah Smith. It's called Europa. And I'm pretty sure that that one was only 30 pages. It wasn't a pamphlet that I love but I've loved plenty others in their series and what they publish is amazing so I recommend them in general and then I have a few more stats for you so in 2022 um 70% of the books that I read were under 300 pages 28% of the books were between 300 and 500 pages and then only 1% of the books I read were over 500 pages 
I am not surprised by that. And Storygraph tells me that I mostly read medium paced fiction, which I'm also not surprised by. My moods, the mood reading that Storygraph lists, is pretty much exactly the same for 2021 to 2022, which again, doesn't surprise me. So um, the moods are reflective, emotional, mysterious, dark. They're apparently my top four moods. And the previous year it was reflective, emotional, um, dark, mysterious. I think it was just two ones that were in a different order. But the genre this time is slightly different. And I think that is only down to the fact that in 2021, I read all of those Nikki French books, which really skewed my genre to having mystery and thriller at the top, followed by literary and contemporary. Whereas in 2022, my top genres were literary, contemporary, poetry, and mystery. Um, I also have this graph showing you how many books I read and how many pages in each month. I didn't read anything in May or September because I was very ill, but it fluctuates a lot throughout the year and that's always been the case. So again, that didn't surprise me either. So those are the stats from 2022. I think that those are all the things that I wrote down. I didn't have any goals going into 2022 um, apart from reading books that I enjoy, please. And I definitely read a lot of books that I liked very much. My favourites list this year is very strong and I look forward to talking to you about those next week. I just think it's interesting to look at all of this data and if you want to share any of your data from reading in 2022, any goals that you had, whether you reached them, whether you didn't, please leave those in a comment down below because I would love to read them. If you are new to my channel and you enjoyed this video and you would like to subscribe, that'd be great. I normally review things in more detail and more depth than in this video, um, but this is just a run through of everything. And if you enjoy my channel and you would like to support me on Patreon, I will link that in the description box down below. Patreon is a place where you can tip your favorite creators and support over there allows me to continue making free content for everybody, taking the time to make it accessible and all of that stuff. The support is so appreciated and there's some extra content over there if you are interested as well. Thank you so much for joining me this evening or whenever you happen to be watching this video. Happy New Year and sending lots of love to you all. Bye.